everybody welcome back to the channel it feels good to be back after nearly a what three month hiatus uh, but life was lifing and i had to go out and learn some new things but i am now back i want to give a super duper big shout out to my new good friend and fellow youtuber d rosa for not only just having excellent photography commentary but feels like every single day but also holding it down and making sure my name does not disappear out here now there are some things that I've been seeing in the street photography community that are borderline egregious. And a lot of them have to deal with gear being recommended to enthusiasts or non-professional photographers. When it comes to street photography, this is a field that is almost entirely predicated on two things. How astute you are and how quickly you can notice a moment, that's one thing and how skilled you are at actually bringing the image to life. Now, in any of those two statements that I say the word gear, I will not sit here and lie to people and say that gear doesn't matter. It absolutely 100% matters. But the types of gear that you need when it comes to street photography are where things get a little gray. A lot of different things can do 95% of the job in street photography, but that doesn't mean that as a whole gear doesn't matter. So to not mince any more words, I have three recommendations for gear that you do not need on your street photography journey. Uh, three things that you should steer clear of and three recommendations that I have in place of those because I've gone through many lenses, bodies, techniques, and made many mistakes. And hopefully I can save you guys from screwing up on some of the things that I did. Let's get into it. Beginning with number one, what you do not need in street photography is an expensive, fast aperture lens. Now, there is a wonderful street photography quote that is very popular in the community. I don't know who originally said it, but it goes, quote, set it to F8 and just be there. Capturing the essence of a scene and an environment and subjects within the context of an environment you want to be able to get as much of that in focus as possible without really having to worry about it in between lighting scenarios and environments. So that pretty much begins at f5.6, but f8 is just a bit more safe. Now, that might not sound as alluring as 1.4, but you got to think about it. How is 1.4 going to help you capture a wide scene in detail? Exactly, it won't. So if that's the case, why do you need a 1.2, 1.4, or 1.8 lens? Especially in the case of Fujifilm, which I dearly love, consider this. The 23 millimeter F2 is a $450 lens, brand new, I believe. And the old school 23 millimeter 1.4, at the time of making this, I believe is seven or $800. I'll put the real price if I got it wrong. And when you put those next to each other, the 23 millimeter F2, you get an all metal build, weather resistance, a small lens, and some of the sharpest image quality I've ever seen. Versus in the 23 millimeter 1.4, you get also some of the sharpest image quality I've ever seen, no weather resistance, almost double the weight, and not as good of a build for almost double the price. Now you're getting 1.4, but even if you're somebody who likes to do street portraits, somebody who's like myself and loves to interact with people while they're out and about shooting, you do not need 1.4 to get a good portrait. I will go as far as to say that if you want to get a, sharp fo a, a sharply focused portrait, everything looking good, you can do that at F4, ask Steve McCurry. If you wanna get freaky with it, and you wanna start having some real separation and bokeh in the background, you can do that at f2.8. And if you really just want to be a monster with it and just go crazy, you can do that at f2. Even in the case of portrait photographers, I'm beginning to think that the whole 1.2, now with Fuji the 1.0, all of that nonsense is kind of just a marketing gimmick because the diminishing return is crazy. Going from the 50 millimeter F2 on Fuji, which is $450, to the 50 millimeter 1.0 is a $1,000 difference. Your images will not come out any better if you get a larger, heavier, slower lens that isn't even conducive to capturing an entire environment in detail in the first place. Number two in the list of gear that you do not need as a street photographer is a brand new flagship body. Now, my buddy and fellow YouTuber D Rosa has plenty of brilliant photography takes on his YouTube channel, but one of my favorites is the notion that you should go for an old flagship body over even something like a new entry-level body. 
So for example, instead of going with the X-T4, if you're someone looking for great photo and video performance, you should look at the X-T3 or even the X-H1, which are half the cost if we're talking a used body. Let's say we're talking the X100V, a camera we all know I love dearly. Instead of that, you could also go for the X100F, which is nearly half the cost used. And aside from a couple of quality of life improvements, like weather sealing, uh, a bit sharper of a lens, and a couple of other things that honestly don't matter too, too much, if we're just talking the photographer who wants to capture his life, the photographer who wants to take pictures of her family, somebody that just wants to have a tool by their side that's easy to carry and capture those sweet moments of life, you don't need an X-Pro3 for that. You don't need an X100V for that. I've used both of them. So much money can be saved if we just realize, if we just made a list of the 10 core things that we need to do for our type of photography, we'll see that most cameras since 2017 do all of those. Now, like I said, if you just have it like that, go ahead and buy it. I've used four flagship cameras across this channel, but I'm just saying in my long-term experience with all of these, when it comes to the average photographer, a brand new flagship, it's not gonna do anything for you, I, I promise. The third and final type of gear that you do not need for street photography is expensive editing hardware or software. Now, many of you already know this, but my first camera I ever bought was the A7 III the year it came out. And with it, I got the 50 millimeter 1.8, which eventually turned into the Sigma 35 millimeter 1.4. So for my first kit, I spent, I wanna say $2,800 after tax, which was way too, too much camera. So much camera that I had zero money left over to buy some good editing hardware. So I had to buy a lightning port dongle and edit all my photos on an iPhone 8 Plus. And let me tell you, it actually did a pretty good job, all things considered. When it came to apps like Visco, Snapseed, and even Lightroom Mobile, it was doing the job, and the A7 III has some pretty decently sized files. I was able to edit the majority of the time with little to no hiccups. The phone would get pretty hot, but it did what I needed to do for that six or so months until I got an iPad Pro. So what does this mean for you? That means that if you were thinking about grabbing a MacBook Pro, a MacBook Air, or even an iPad Pro, something that I make all my videos on and do all my editing with, you could get the brand new entry level iPad for around $300 and still have a very powerful tool for editing all of your images. Let's say that you do wanna mess around with the concept of making videos for YouTube or whatever. The new iPad Air is still around half the cost of an iPad Pro and just as powerful as the iPad Pro second gen that I originally bought when I first started doing all of this. Pretty much that when it comes to a lot of this marketing, we're all being tricked because with every single product that we are salivating over that's brand new, the old version of it that's half the cost or the lesser version that's half the cost does 90% of the job. Now, do not take this as me saying that I'm not gonna keep on using flagship bodies, cause I am but I have my reasons that I find ways to justify. But if you're a photographer who just wants to take pictures of their friends and family, somebody who just wants to do it as a hobby, and you're not too, too concerned with having the latest and greatest, you can do so much of what everybody out here is doing with honestly so much less. And when you consider these museum galleries that you look at, these people are not printing 30 by 40. These museum prints are small as heck, you know? They're as big as window ACs. When you consider the amount of megapixels that these cameras resolved at, it was no 26, it was no 30, it was no 42. So much of what we love, what made us fall in love with photography was done on so much less. And even though we have access to all these amazing things, it doesn't mean that if you don't have a way to justify it that you should do it anyway. I love the X100V, I love the X-Pro3, I love the X-T4. And I'm going to keep using them because I found ways of how they fit perfectly into my creative life. But if you're just trying to do things for enjoyment, you don't need to break the bank. I mean, there is so much that an older flagship, an F2.8 or an F4 lens, or an entry-level iPad can do. So much that it can get you started and further than you probably imagined. But that's all I have on this topic. Thank you to everybody who watched. 
Everybody who's been subscribed this whole time, thanks for sticking it out. D Rosa, my buddy, I want to thank you for constantly shouting me out, probably more than you should have in all your videos. Everybody, please go check him out. And on that note, I will see you guys in the next one. Until then.